Welcome to this, uh, to this conference. It's a privilege for me to open the conference and I would like to congratulate uh, the DG Economics, which is uh, the organizers of this uh, very uh, timely and, and uh, appropriate uh, conference. So thank you very much uh, to you all for having done that. And I hope we can demonstrate uh, the transformative power of AI and all its implications in the course of those two days. You all had a session this morning, didn't you? Yeah, workshop and, and all the rest of it, and I hope it was as good as the quick lunch that you had as well, um, which takes you to a time when maybe you feel more like having a nap, but I'm not going to let you do that. So bear with me. And uh, I'm, I'm, I will really rehearse, I'm sure, some of the key principles that you will deep dive into in the rest of the day and tomorrow as well, uh, because this is really, I'm, I'm not trying to be innovative in that respect but I'm grateful to those who have helped me draft this speech. So in the early uh, stages of a new technological breakthrough, it's often hard to discern between the facts and fiction. We struggle to imagine the ways in which the new technology is going to be used or not. And even if we predict the direction of technological change correctly, we rarely get the timing and the size of the impact right. Today we sometimes hear claims that AI is improving so fast that we are only a few years away from the nature of work being radically reformed. But we also hear arguments that the same barriers that slowed down the adoption of past technologies are also going to delay AI technology and AI adoption. So I don't know which of the two vision will prove to be correct. But the early evidence is promising, and in my view, we must act on the basis that we are facing, possibly, possibly, an economic revolution. This attitude will be particularly important here in Europe. On this side of the Atlantic, we are still today paying the price for having been too slow to capitalize on the last major digital revolution, the internet. The tech sector explains around two-thirds of the productivity gap between the United States of America and us since the turn of the century. And now we are faced with a technology that can improve its own performance through self-learning mechanisms and feedback loops, enabling even more rapid advances in technology and innovations. The risks of underestimating the potential of AI and falling behind again are simply too great to be ignored. What's more, we are facing a new geopolitical environment in which we can no longer be sure that we will have frictionless, easy access to new technologies that are developed elsewhere. The new reality, that new reality, strengthens the case for Europe to establish itself at the technological frontier. There are two main areas where we should expect and prepare for major changes in the economy. There are many others that, that I'm sure you will delve into, but there are two that I would want to flag for you. One is productivity, the other one is impact on labor markets. We can already see the productivity effects of AI in sectors like the US tech sector, where output is expanding while employment is falling. But we are still in the early phase of the productivity J-curve, where new technologies diffuse to the wider economy and are reflected in GDP as well. As such, estimates about the productivity gains of AI vary widely. But even at the lower end, they would be a game changer in Europe. One widely accepted methodology estimates that the euro area could see a boost to total factor of productivity of around 0.3% per year over the next 10 years. Now compare with the past decade when annual, annual TFP growth averaged just 0.5%. Even that low end is a significant change. Other estimates point to much larger gains, with productivity expected to grow 
1.5 percentage point faster annually if AI is widely adopted over the next decade. Now, whether Europe can achieve such productivity gains will depend on whether we can improve the environment for AI innovation and diffusion. And that comes down to, I don't know in which order to put them, but I guess money comes first, or funding, energy, and regulation. As I've been arguing for some time, Europe's relatively small venture capital ecosystem is a major hindrance to building foundational models in the EU. Between 2018 and 2023, around 33 billion euros was invested in AI companies in the EU, compared with more than 120 billion euros as well in the US peers. 3320. Building and developing this technology also requires considerable, in, considerable investment in data centers, and the EU currently has around four times fewer dedicated sites than the United States. At the same time, ECB research finds that regulation and a lack of institutional quality are particularly detrimental to the expansion of high-tech sectors relative to more mature technologies. Investing in radical technologies is highly risky and needs a different set of framework conditions. The adoption of AI, for example, depends on access to data pools to train models, which requires smart regulation to avoid data fragmentation, while at the same time ensuring data protection. It also requires good institutions, as for instance, effective legal systems are needed to defend a non-patentable -patent asset, like a set of AI prompts. Our research shows that if the EU's average institutional delivery were raised to the level of best practice, AI-intensive sectors would see their share in investment rise by more than 10 percentage points. Finally, unless we see major breakthroughs in efficiency, Europe's energy supply constraints could pose a major challenge to the diffusion of AI through the economy in the future. The power consumption of data centers is expected to triple in Europe by the end of the decade. AI training and inference is extremely energy intensive. And this surge in demand comes at a time when the green transition is also increasing the demand for electricity, for example, for charging battery electric vehicles, to only name one example. There is now a clear policy agenda in Europe to address these barriers. It is widely recognized that we need to build a savings and investment union, I call it capital market union, but let's use savings and investment, to jumpstart European venture capital, that we must simplify complex digital regulations and improve permitting speeds, and that we have to massively increase investment in data centers, fiber optic networks, and electricity grids. But for Europe to make the most of the AI revolution, how the productivity gains from AI are harnessed also matters. Productivity can be increased either by reducing labor inputs relative to outputs or by raising outputs relative to inputs. The employment implications of each route are vastly different. And that brings me to the second point that I want to address briefly after the productivity, one that we just discussed, the effect that AI can have on labor markets. Again, according to our research, between 23% and 29% of workers in Europe are highly exposed to AI. Now, that does not necessarily mean job apocalypse. It is reasonable to expect that AI will follow historical patterns by displacing some jobs while creating new ones. But there are two new questions that this technology raises. First, will the pace of technological change be faster than in previous transitions? 
And this question is critical for Europe, as our social model and traditional high levels of job protection make it hard to see how a transition that leads to massive job reallocations could avoid a major backlash. The key factor will be whether AI leans more towards job displacement via its automation potential or towards changes in the nature of work via its augmentation potential. So automation versus augmentation. In the augmentation scenario, workers will still need to adapt to changing roles and tasks, but the transition will likely be easier. Recent research by the, the International Labour Organization finds that only a small share of jobs, about 5% in advanced economies, meet the criteria for high automation. But a much larger share, over 13%, meet the criteria for high augmentation. The second question is about the distribution of gains. Early studies suggested that AI could increase the productivity of lower skilled workers the most. But more recent research, looking at more complex tasks like scientific research, running a business and investing, tell now a different story. High performers, benefit disproportionately and in some cases and in some cases less productive workers see zero improvement so even if ai augments more than it automates we are likely to see an increase in labor market inequality demand for higher skilled workers who can use ai more effectively will rise while those less able to learn those new skills could suffer. So all told, I do see a path for Europe to adopt AI without fracturing its social model, but it will require massive, massive complementary investment in skills to prevent a rise in inequality. Crucially, this will not require everyone to become expert at coding. According to the OECD, most workers who will be exposed to AI will not need specialized AI skills to get ahead in their careers. Now, that's good news for some of us. Huh? In fact, from that OECD work, the most sought after skills in highly exposed jobs will be linked to management and to business. Those are skills that many people have the capacity to learn. Let me mention a, 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 a nice description by the CEO of Anthropic, Dario Amodei, um, to define what is the potential of AI capacities. He describes it as a country of geniuses in a data center. Not sure we all want to spend a weekend with those, but that's, that's the capacity that AI would have. And this, if this proves to be correct, it is both an awesome prospect for humanity and a daunting one for individual workers. And I think that we must act today, especially in Europe, under the circumstances, with the mindset that the future, this future, will likely come to pass. We must remove all barriers that will prevent us from being at the forefront of that revolution. But we must also prepare for the human and climate impact. I haven't discussed any of that, but I'm sure that you will touch on that in the next hours. So the human and climate impact of this transition, and we need to get started now. So I'm sure that during the course of this conference, with all this brain power of geniuses around, we will be able to understand better the ramifications of AI, the investment it requires, the barriers that need to be removed, and that we will make progress. But count on us, and I know the economic department is on board with that. Number one, we are adopting, we are using, we are pushing ourselves, and we will continue to do so because we want to be at that frontier and beyond. Thank you very much.